Good morning, everyone, and welcome. We're going to get started in about two minutes. Good morning, everyone. Um, we'll get started in just another couple of minutes. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Ann Sassen, and I'm the program director for Dartmouth Center for Global Health Equity. I'm pleased to welcome you to, you to today's Pandemic Partnership for Equity of Information webinar. Today's session will focus on the treatment of COVID-19 patients in low and middle income settings and will be led by Dr. David Walton. Dr. Walton is the CEO and co-founder of Build Health International. He is also an associate physician in the Division of Global Health Equity at Brigham and Women's Hospital and an instructor in medicine at Harvard Medical School. David has been working in the COVID-19 unit at Brigham and Women's Hospital for the last several weeks and brings decades of experience working in Haiti and other low and middle income countries. Today's session will be recorded and posted online. A brief document summarizing the information will also be shared following the session. If you have a question or comment, please insert it into the comments section and we'll take questions after, this, uh, after the brief presentation. We are able to take questions in English, Spanish, and French today. Thank you, Dr. Walton, for joining us. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thanks, Anne, for having me. I'll say at the outset that 
you know, we're talk talking about treatment of COVID-19 in low and middle income countries. And uh, it should be notable to all of you, uh, or I should say explicitly rather, I'm sitting in Boston, right? And so think of me as a surrogate. Um, I think this is now, as we look about, as we look at the, the pandemic and where it's hit, it's really hit so far, at least the majority of cases have been in high income countries, China, Italy, the United States. And we're just seeing an uptick in many low and middle income countries. And so my hope is that the next time you hear this talk, it won't be from me or someone sitting in Boston, but rather someone with the experience in those low and middle income countries telling you about their experience sort of on the ground uh, within their settings. So with that caveat aside, uh, I'll jump right in. So, you know, I think it's important to understand and many of you may have sort of heard this and seen this, that the majority of COVID-19 patients don't require hospitalization. You know, it, it has a spectrum of presentation and 80% of those people who get it have symptoms that are either completely asymptomatic, i.e. they don't actually feel anything, they don't even know they're sick, or a cold or a flu-like illness. Uh, in terms of feeling like a flu-like illness, but a full 20% are sick enough, they actually require hospitalization. And it's important, important for us to think about, again, I'm sitting in Boston, I have spent much of the last two months at the Brigham and Women's Hospital treating COVID patients here, and most of our patients are coming in either as referrals from other hospitals, community hospitals, or they dial 911 and get transferred to the Brigham via EMS. In the settings in which we're discussing today, it's really critical to think about the fact that we really have to think about that differently and how we create access differently because in many of these situations, there is no EMS, <clears throat> there is no 911. And so how do we think about leveraging the resources that, are, that exist to be able to get them to the people who need them when they need them? And this is a tricky disease, as we'll talk about, and it can come fast and furious uh, with outcomes that can be really devastating. And so we'll talk about symptoms, we'll talk about treatment options, uh, and we'll talk briefly about uh, severe cases of COVID-19 and how we might think about them in terms of treatment in low and middle income settings. So actually, I just, I think, mentioned all these things. Um, so I'll keep going. Oops. So let's move on to the signs and symptoms of COVID-19. You know, you'll see, I, I'm grateful to Anne and her students. They have a fantastic team of people who really did the lion's share of the work putting this presentation together. I call that out to both uh, shout them out and also to, to call your attention to the fact that this is a well buttressed talk with a variety of references. So when you uh, access the PowerPoint presentation or the accompanying documents online, you'll see all of the the references from which this uh, talk was derived. Moving into signs and symptoms of COVID-19. Again, the tricky part of this disease is that it presents in a way that so many other illnesses can present, cough, shortness of breath, and fever. There's large case series in places like Wuhan, where the epidemic, or sorry, the pandemic originated. And now large case series out of New York, an epicenter, in the United States and, in, and, and case series out of Italy. And when you look at the distribution of presentation of symptoms, it really, the majority of cases are presenting with some element of cough, some element of shortness of breath, but not always, right? Fever, you know, in some, in one of the uh, Wuhan case series, over 50% of patients who presented didn't have a fever when they came in. They developed it after hospitalization and so, you know, the presentation can be very tricky and you have to have a very high index of suspicion in order to really think about, you know, does this patient have COVID or does, and should I test this patient for COVID if you have testing available? We're gonna to touch on that in a bit. But again, the CDC expanded the symptom the symptomatology um, about a few weeks ago to include things like muscle pain, sore throat, sputum production, again, a lot of these things can happen, they don't happen a majority of the time, but they do happen some of the time. People that I've seen at the hospital, and then again in the literature, you'll note 
don't present sometimes with cough or shortness of breath or fever. They come in with GI upset. So you think, oh, I ate something funny. And in fact, that's your heralding uh, symptom uh, for COVID-19. So, you know, again, and you may have read in the media, people are developing a loss of taste and smell. Sometimes that's their only symptom. So all of this to say, there's a there's a, a variety of symptoms that one needs to be on the lookout for. Again, as we say in medicine, your differential diagnosis or the, the, the things that this could be extend far beyond COVID-19. But again, in a pandemic, if it quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, it might be a duck, test it, prove it's a duck. And again, it's important to call out in pediatric, or sorry, uh, in some cases, kids are developing COVID-19, but in a way that is different than adults. Again, when you look at the epidemiological data so far, the majority of cases are noted in really people over 18, and the majority of morbidity and mortality certainly skewed towards uh, people older than 60. But kids are developing this. We're still really developing a burgeoning understanding of what that looks like, but some kids are developing a sort of a, a vasculitis type presentation similar to a disease that they see not so infrequently in pediatrics called Kawasaki's disease. And then some kids are developing a rash on their feet involving their toes, uh, again, accompanied sometimes by other symptoms that is often uh, COVID-19. So kids can, all, <laughs> the, my last point on this is kids can often be asymptomatic carriers as well. So just to take a brief tangent, when we do think about opening schools, what's that going to look like? How are we going to deal with this? It's very, very tricky because although kids are doing well, generally speaking, they might, you know, be, you know, infect their teachers. They might infect their parents. And so, you know, moving forward, this is still going to be very tricky to think about as we think about both settings here and places that are uh, COVID-19 that are already entrenched and also particularly in resource limited settings. So great, I come in, I have some symptoms. Maybe I don't need to be hospitalized, maybe I do. How do we think about that? I mean, I think the mainstay of that decision-making is really sort of the criticality of your illness. It's a broad statement, how do we really think about that? Again, the, fir the first thing that we're always going to do or we always want to do, if we have access, and that's critical, is to measure your oxygen right? What is your oxygen saturation? That drives all of our decision-making moving forward. I'm sitting here talking to you, looking at myself on the screen awkwardly. My oxygen saturation is probably anywhere between 97 to 99, maybe 100%. When you, for COVID-19 patients, depending on their comorbidities, if they're less than 94, 93, 92%, you know, it's important that they have access to oxygen, which again, we'll talk about in detail. And, you know, if they need oxygen, that's certainly a, an overwhelming re, uh, indication that they should be hospitalized to have access to oxygen. Again, but you, if you, let's say you don't have a uh, pulse oximeter, really, uh, you know, the, the tool that is, is needed to measure someone's oxygen saturation. Again, you can do these things. You can sort of clinically judge hypoxemia it's tough and it's not great and it's not overly accurate, but bluish lips in the face uh, that people can develop can, or bluish fingertips can also be a sign. But in addition to hypoxemia, there, you know, if people are over, in general sort of not doing well, meaning if they have new confusion, they might be delirious as we say, you know, not really clear on their surroundings because they're just a, a, it's a symptom of systemic illness. They may have a pneumonia really manifesting by shortness, significant shortness of breath and an increased respiratory rate. Baseline respiratory rate, anywhere from four to eight or 10, just sitting here, talking, relaxing, watching Netflix. You know, if you're breathing at a rate of 20 or more, you're struggling and you, we need to sort of address that. Um, or urine output and little to no urine output, that really just points to, again, because COVID-19 can affect all of your organs, it sometimes affects your kidneys in addition to sort of, it's really a systemic inflammation and that's a, a certainly a heralding sign that that needs to be addressed likely in the hospital. 
Um, and then other issues or, or things like chest pain that might be worrisome that really need and, and call for a workup that's uh, uh, sort of in the hospital. So you come in, we're, we're, we're worried, we send you into, you know, if you, if in a resource limited setting, actually, I'm gonna uh, go on a brief tangent here because we're talking about radiologic presentation. We moved right into radiologic presentation, but how do we think about cohorting patients? Meaning if I'm worried that you have COVID-19, I certainly don't want to put you with, with the pregnant woman who's just there to deliver her baby, her healthy baby. And so we really need to have a high index of suspicion, we really need to think about screening all patients who are coming to a facility. And again, we do that here at the Brigham, but that's also certainly important for as COVID-19 really begins to be entrenched in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, Haiti, there's a huge uptick in cases that we can touch on a little bit. You really wanna think about how to separate suspect patients from patients who you have a much lower index of suspicion for so that you're not infecting patients who are there to deliver their baby or have a broken femur or something with COVID because you're mixing them with COVID patients. And then we think about testing and testing is a tricky, tricky situation here in the US uh, and in other settings, high income settings, we have access to PCR, real time PCR, reverse transcriptase PCR. Again, you need a very advanced laboratory in which to do that. Um, I think a colleague of mine, Ryan Jiha, is on the phone who I've known for a long time. And he and I were just texting yesterday about um, uh, the access in Haiti to RT-PCR. Currently, Haiti, population of 10 million, there are only two labs in the country that have the capability of doing RT-PCR. What does that mean? That for your best and most definitive tests, there's only two labs, 10 million people. You do the math, it doesn't work. So, you know, it, that in and Haiti is, again, representative of many low and middle, low income countries or very low income countries. And there are struggles around just getting the diagnosis if it's not a clinical diagnosis, right? So all the things that we went through already, clinical diagnosis, we, we can create a case definition and, and they already have that around, you know, cohorting patients and, and sort of treating them for COVID. But at the end of the day, you really want a definitive test. RT-PCR is the best test that we have right now, but access is incredibly limited. And so you may have heard of rapid tests, so-called amino assays, right? They're looking for antibody production uh, against COVID-19. The problem with that, and I'll get off this tangent in a second, uh, but the problem with those rapid amino assays is A, they're wishy-washy in terms of how good they are, that's a rabbit hole we won't have time to go into today, but me and more specifically, wishy-washy. I mean, the sensitivity and specificity is not where you would like it to be in terms of, of, of reducing number of false positives and false negatives. That's the first thing. The second thing is when we think about antibody production, like most illnesses in your immune system, virus, bacteria, et cetera, or excuse me, virus in this case, you get the virus, it takes your body time to develop the antibodies. So you have these very traditional curves uh, in terms of antibody production, and there are some very specific now for COVID, it's only within day four, day six, day seven, or day, day five through seven really, that you're beginning to produce antibodies. And we may talk about this, the onset of symptoms is day zero, you're actually, spreading the virus up to two to three days before the onset of symptoms, right? So you're already shedding virus uh, before you even know you're sick. And so <laughs> the antibody test is not a great way, given that delay and given the fact that you don't also want to diagnose people quickly so you can both treat them but also prevent them from spreading it to others. Antibody test is not a great way for acute diagnosis for this disease. There's antigen testing, and other things and other modalities. But again, it's really, really tricky and the testing isn't where it needs to be. And I, there's a many, many companies around the world really focused on this. But it, I highlight this really because it's a very specific problem to low and middle income countries. And frankly, sitting in the US, we don't have widespread availability of testing. Um, and it's a real challenge 
in terms of diagnosing and then treating for COVID-19. Let's move on to the radiologic presentation. And so in most resource limited settings, if you're gonna have anything, you're either gonna have ultrasound, which is tricky to diagnose COVID-19, but at least maybe plain film chest X-ray, right? Which we, and we see that on the right. You see a normalish chest X-ray on the upper right, you know, big black lungs, open air spaces. COVID-19 produces what in the, in the radiologists call ground glass opacities. You'll learn radiologists love these really weird and interesting descriptions of uh, <laughs> for uh, radiologic findings. Ground glass presentations, essentially as an internist, I interpret that as a, it's a hazy, what we call infiltrate. So if you look at the bottom right, that's an extreme example. Typically, when patients are coming in and they're just a little bit short of breath, their chest x-rays aren't that bad. But you're gonna see sort of cloudy infiltrates. That's in contrast to what we see typically in a bacterial pneumonia, where we see a big sort of fat white infiltrate that's discrete. And we say, oh, there it is. We can point to it. Oh, there it is. That looks like a bacterial pneumonia. This is much more diffuse uh, involvement in the lung. CT scan, if you have it, is fantastic. <clears throat> we CT scan almost everyone here at the Brigham. Again, many low-income countries uh, and low-income settings, I should say, won't have access. But if you do, it's great to prove that diagnosis out, at least radiologically, and you'll see on the left a variety of scans that show a varying degree of severity uh, of COVID-19. And I can tell you, you know, this is, you know, the, the radiologists now just sort of automatically, you know, we get a scan, patients, sometimes they're not yet symptomatic. The radiologist is saying this is highly suspicious for COVID-19. You've seen so much of it and it presents in this very classic way. It doesn't always have to present that way. Sometimes you catch them so early that they then develop those radiologic findings, so the radiologic findings lag. But more often than not, we're seeing these pretty early on. But again, in low-income settings, chest X-ray is your best bet, um, and your sort of clinical diagnosis and height index of suspicion. Again, we've talked about this. Um, you know, it's you know the the primary findings that's sort of deep radiology, <laughs> crazy paving, the sort of you know, what the radi you know, radiologists are talking about, again, for the purposes of this talk, is diffuse infiltrates, looks cloudy, characteristic finding, that matched up with the, the, the symptoms, you know, you're in, in, a, in a high index of suspicion, you're, you're, you're really going to push for thinking this person has COVID-19. I will say, you know, again, in settings in which you don't have access to testing, this is tricky because a lot of uh, uh, pneumonias can also present this way, shortness of breath, fever, and diffuse infiltrates, you know, particularly vi other viral pneumonias or um, fungal pneumonias classically can present this way. So it isn't a slam dunk when you see this and you really have to be careful around obtaining, you know, clinically the right history um, and an understanding of the fact that if you don't have access to testing, you know, it's, a re it's very, very tricky for the clinical diagnosis. But again, if you do have access to testing, Test, test, test. It's the only way we're going to know. But other things that we see um, in terms of laboratory indications. So when someone comes in, we check a variety of labs. But the first and foremost, if you have access to laboratory testing, you're going to want to check a complete blood count, right? So you're looking primarily at white blood cell count, red blood cell count, and your platelets. But, and that's helpful. But what we particularly see, and the data bears out in these large clinical observational studies of 40,000 patients, 20,000 patients, many out of China, but again, some out of New York, is that they have what's called a lymphopenia. I might have a normal white blood cell count or maybe a little bit elevated, but the degree of lymphocytes in my blood, which you can get on a CBC, or a complete blood count, we call it CBC, is, uh, is reduced out of proportion to your blood count, right? So you have a normal range of lymphocytes that should be in your blood when we count, we just literally count it. If it's manual, you have a lymphopenia or a lack of lymphocytes that you notice that is a very classic hallmark, uh, hematologic hallmark of COVID-19. So our index of suspicion, I keep talking about this index of suspicion, particularly in low-income settings, <clears throat> low-resource settings, is if you see someone with symptoms, you may not have access to chest x-ray potentially, 
but you see a lymphopenia, again, you're gonna say, ah, this is potentially COVID-19. If you have a more robust laboratory and you can do tests like D-dimer, lactate dehydrogenase, we call it LDH, C-reactive protein, ferritin, sed rate, those are essentially, <clears throat> if I bunch those all together, those are inflammatory markers. There are many people who would say, oh, that's too, much, that's too dull of a, of a knife you're using to describe these things. But let's just keep it simple. These are, out, these are inflammatory markers. We're going to see inflammation throughout the body. These are gonna go up. The higher they go up, the sicker you are. These are correlated. They're not always exact, but they're correlated. And so when you see, oh, you know, things that can be uh, associated with poor outcomes, you know, when we see, you know, D-dimer that's greater than, you know, in our assay in the, at the Brigham is 4,000, really high D-dimers, really high CRP, C-reactive protein, you're sick, right? So it's, it's, they're, not, you, they're not typically out of proportion to your clinical observations, and so you can sort of match them up. And then there's some things at the bottom. Uh, liver enzymes, we actually typically do, we measure them all the time, and we typically do see an elevation in your liver enzymes, more specifically, your AST and your ALT, um, th and there's, it's unclear sort of if that's just a cytopathic effect of the, of the, the virus itself in the liver, but those sort of trend up and trend down as the person gets better, worse initially, and then better. And then IL-6, that's, that's in the weeds, we won't go there today. But some colleagues of mine at the Brigham put this next slide together. It's in a paper that you'll see at the bottom referenced. Um, and I think it's actually a very good understanding of sort of what the illness looks like physiologically. Uh, and it matches up nicely with what we typically see in terms of symptoms, right? So, and you have stages, stage one, stage two, stage three. This is a rubric. Excuse me. There are a variety of other rubrics that are out there, um, but essentially, you know, your initial set of, your initial viral response physiologically, your body, you know, is infected with the virus, it's ramping up, you're having symptoms, it might be cough, diarrhea, headache, again, we talked about lymphopenia, D-dimer, et cetera. You move on in the stage of illness, you know, now you're day five, now you're day six, now you're day seven, the, the viral response phase is decreasing, but your inflammatory response, really essentially your immune response is increasing, right? And this is important because unlike other illnesses, we see this very unique and interesting, not interesting, poor choice of words, unique and notable window period of really day five to day 10 where people are cruising along, I'm young, I'm healthy, I'm feeling, I'm living my best life, I have a little cough, ah, it's a little bit problematic. Okay, I get hospitalized, you know, I need maybe a little bit of oxygen, and then all of a sudden I take a deep and precipitous nosedive. My oxygen fat drops, I struggle to breathe, and I need to be intubated. And it happens quickly, and you know, it's, it can be quite, quite devastating if you don't have access to intubation and things of that nature. And ventilation, but it really correlates to sort of this graph of, you know, it's your, it's your immune response that's sort of really cascading in a way that is unfortunately, uh, you know, not ideal uh, and gets you much sicker much more quickly. And again, when you see this, is, uh, you know, these are young people who, who develop this by young, I mean, sort of 30s, 40s, 20s, but this is, uh, you know, again, in these higher risk age groups, then you, you can often see worsening outcomes with, and, and if you go all the way to the right, ARDS, uh, which is, you know, again, we won't go into the weeds here, but essentially severe lung inflammation need to be ventilated, uh, associated with uh, high, uh, high morbidity and mortality, uh, sort of shock, et cetera. And so we'll move on to, I know I'm, I'm, uh, it's 8.30 already, so I'm gonna move a little bit more quickly and so when we think, so that was the presentation, now we're moving into treatment and how are we gonna deal with this thing, right? Especially in low and middle income country settings. I keep saying countries, what I really mean is settings. Hypoxia, again, this is so critically important. And let's be clear, 
in the absence of other access to therapeutics, and, and there are no proven therapeutics, we can talk about remdesivir in a minute, oxygen is your most important feature. If you don't have oxygen, it's devastating, especially if you need it, right, for those 20% of cases. And so it's our, most, it's our most effective therapeutic for this disease. So, you know, when we think about oxygen, we talked about the thresholds for oxygen, less than 94%. You know, if that's the case, I need to support you. If I have access to oxygen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this on. And sometimes, you know, you, you're, if you have, again, it's, oxygen always needs to be paired with oximetry. And the, you know, if, you're, if your oximetry is less than, you're, you're, sorry, I should say you're titrating to your oximetry to be essentially above 92, 93%. And so you're, you're sort of, you can keep dialing up your oxygen like a rheostat to be able to, um, you know, uh, get that to that, that level. Sometimes the, the degree of inflammation is so severe that you're really maxing out. And again, this is going to be important in uh, resource limited settings. At the Brigham, when, or, or, or if there's resource settings, we tend to intubate early. Why do we intubate early, meaning at six liters per minute, which is you know, the max that we're going to go to? Two particular reasons that are important. Number one is when you get above six liters per minute of oxygen and you get to higher flows of oxygen, sort of oxygen really, if you're in a face mask and it's, you're really cranking it up, if you have that ability, the more you do that above six liters, the higher there is a risk of aerosolization of the virus. I'm not going to go on a tangent, um, but all this is to um, transmission and, uh, dynamics, but important to note that this, we always think of this currently, most of us, there's some conflicting data, the, this, this is spread by, the virus is spread by droplet nuclei, right? Six feet, mask, the whole thing. But if there are cases in which you can aerosolize the virus, meaning the virus then is able to hang in the air for a little bit longer amount of time. It's in smaller nuclei that float as opposed to drop to the ground. And so there's a higher risk that healthcare workers or anyone else in the room can get infected. And so when you turn that oxygen up, there's a higher risk of aerosolization and a higher risk of what we call in the biz, nosocomial infection. Nosocomial infection is just a fancy way to say virus or any illness that is transmitted in the hospital. So that's concern number one. Concern number two um, for high levels of oxygen is that you essentially you're going to max out. And, you know, when you don't want to, in, at least in settings like here, you're going to want to intubate early so you don't have to intubate emergently when the someone when someone is in cardiac arrest or what have you and so we tend to do that let's be clear a lot of low uh, resource limited settings don't have access to ventilators or intubation and so their best bet is to really going to is to max out the oxygen it's tough it's going to be challenging and you know i think without access to ventilation you know there are going to be poor outcomes we're going to Slip over the slide because uh, ventilation is a, a deep dark hole that we <laughs> won't have time to go down. But I will talk about this because this is actually critically important, and this is what's called proning. So proning is just a way that we say to lay on your belly, essentially. And there's a lot of really interesting data. We've done proning in medicine, particularly for uh, ventilated patients, patients with, who are intubated on a ventilator for years, but we do it typically when we're struggling to ventilate them. It's really challenging and we prone them. It's one of our last ditch efforts uh, to try to improve their oxygenation. But there's interesting and really compelling data so far, still collecting all that data, at least people are, that if you're either here at the Brigham or in Boston or wherever you are, or particularly in a low income setting, and you don't have access to intubation, you can improve the rec recruitment of other alveoli in your lungs by proning. And so you essentially, if you can, you, people are either on their side or on their back, typically you ask them to, to lay on their stomach. And what we typically see, if it's going to work, is you see an incremental increase in their oxygen saturation, right? So they're on three, four, eight liters of nasal cannula, and 
you're struggling to get them above 90, they prone and without touching the oxygen, their the, the, uh, supplemental oxygen, their oxygen saturation goes up. And so that can be a really great tool in any setting, but particularly in resource limited settings to try to maximize someone's oxygenation. And this is a great, uh, you can refer to this after the talk, a great sort of uh, slide that was put together, this, uh, particularly by Elmhurst Hospital, which is in New York, which is, was in the epicenter of uh, New York's uh, significant outbreak. Um, we talked about the, the need to transfer to the ICU in terms of oxygenation. Obviously, if there are other ways in which the patient is unstable, heart rate, blood pressure, et cetera, or if they're really, really high risk and you can transfer them, you're going to. But again, uh, sometimes that transfer is not an available option. We're going to move uh, to therapeutic options here in terms of pharmacologic options. And I, I mentioned this because, let's be clear, there isn't anything great out there, right? But there's a lot that's being studied right now and a lot that is hopefully going to come out in terms of potentially uh, effective therapeutics, pharmacologic therapeutics in the coming days. But let's take a look quickly at what, we ha what, what there is some data on. Those of us in the United States have no doubt heard about uh, our president, who is, to our great surprise, taking hydroxychloroquine as a prophylactic. There is a lot of observational data, not head-to-head -head placebo controlled, uh, but large case series out of China, out of the U.S., just looking at them yesterday, uh, in which hydroxychloroquine is just not effective. Again, there needs to be the observational study design is not great, um, but it's enough to say, A, it's not overly effective, we've stopped prescribing it, and B, hydroxychloroquine is risky. It can have significant effects on the electrical system of the heart, and, if it's in, it can have significant deleterious effects and cause fatal arrhythmias in, a, in some people. So at the, at the, if you have access to an EKG, if you're giving hydroxychloroquine, which again, we're not, but if you're giving it we were checking EKGs daily, and if the EKG showed particular parameters for the people who were curious Q, a QT interval that was greater than 500, we wouldn't give it because of the of the risk of fatal arrhythmia. So it's not it's not like it's sort of take it and if it you know it'll be fine. It's risky, and so we don't recommend taking it as prophylactic. There's no data. We don't recommend it as a therapeutic. The data suggests there's no benefit. Hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin. Azithromycin is a uh, it's an antibiotic with significant anti-inflammatory effects. Again, initial data, really no benefit. Lopinavir, ritonavir, that's a, uh, an antiretroviral, antiretroviral used in HIV. Again, not, the data doesn't really support it. Remdesivir, you've all heard of remdesivir. Many of you might have heard of remdesivir. It is an antiviral originally designed to treat Ebola, and I think maybe something else. Didn't work, but now the initial data it's important to note the initial data demonstrates effectiveness, but what is our endpoint for effectiveness? What's been measured and what, what we need to understand is that right now what they're saying is it shortens the duration of illness. Doesn't, doesn't change mortality yet that we know. Again, these are still endpoints that are still being figured out. Doesn't change other things. And that's mortality is something that you really, really want to know in terms of a hard endpoint. But we do know so far, the data is compelling that the average duration of illness for someone is less. And there's some initial data that there's some potentially some mortality benefit. That's great, that's fantastic. This is why there's now, um, they're trying to increase the production of remdesivir and distribute it. But of course, of course, the next question is, oh, that's great, it potentially works. What's access? Access is limited, there are huge questions around equity and access in the U.S. where we're still struggling to distribute it, huge debate around where access is being granted and just in where remdesivir is being distributed versus where it's not. So even within the U.S., there's a lot of controversy, and we're not even talking about low, uh, low resource settings, where in fact, if history is a guide, 
there is always a delay, a significant delay, really the cost of which is measured in lives, in effective therapeutics that are distributed to those who I would say need them most. And so this is going to be tricky. It's going to be hard. It's going to be, I think, a huge challenge. There is the, the Gilead, the manufacturer, did, I think, agree last week to extend the licensing to some generic distributors, or maybe not generic distributors, but some distributors out of India and, and somewhere else. So that's actually a step in the positive direction, but I still anticipate equitable distribution of remdesivir is going to be a challenge, as, as is every other therapeutic. It's important to note also, oxygen is not ubiquitous. It's ubiquitous here, where I sit, but certainly in low and middle income settings, uh, oxygen is uh, uh, can be really uh, vanishingly rare, particularly in urban healthcare, or sorry, rural healthcare settings. I was looking at uh, data from Kenya the other day, where 58% of their 30,000 hospital beds have access to oxygen. And most of that is heterogeneous, right? So centered in urban areas and rural areas, there's a significant lack of oxygen. And that's devastating to those who might need oxygen therapy, really our only effective therapeutic for COVID or frankly, any other reason why one needs oxygen, heart failure, you know, complications of pregnancy, the list is endless. And so that is a significant equity issue as well that uh, folks are trying to work on, including ourselves here at BHI. Let's continue to go on the, down the list. It's a short list and, you know, teaser trailer, nothing's proven out yet, but you have favipiravir, tocilizumab, con convalescent plasma. Favipiravir and tocilizumab, uh, again, we're doing studies right now at the uh, uh, some of these Harvard teaching hospitals. Data is unclear at this point, um, but the the idea around those are to really try to reduce the level of that significant inflammation that can also often have devastating effects in the body in terms of targeted therapy to try to you know, sort of prevent that level of inflammation from happening. Then convalescent plasma, there is initial data that this demonstrates that convalescent plasma or plasma harvesting essentially antibodies from people who have recovered from this and transfusing them into people who are really sick. There is some initial data that that's effective. It'd be great if it is, but again, when we think about limited settings, resource limited settings, it's complicated, expensive, and can't really scale in any significant way. So you know, we're still on the hunt for effective therapeutics. And then finally, antibiotics in and of themselves, this is a virus, they're not effective. But it's important to note that a certain subset of patients develop COVID, and then they develop a bacterial pneumonia on top of their COVID. And so it's important to, if you have a suspicion for a bacterial pneumonia superimposed on the COVID infection, that you administer the antibiotic. It happens not infrequently. And then finally, one last thing before we get to the questions, and this is important uh, any, in any setting, is there is a emerging data that people who have COVID have a tendency to clot much more than those who do not. Now, although that sounds somewhat benign, it actually isn't because this, this, clot, this tendency for clotting manifests itself in potentially life-threatening and devastating ways. So there's a study out of the Netherlands that's referenced here, and they looked at ICU patients. Most of those patients were intubated. And what they found was 30% of those patients developed either what we call a deep vein thrombosis or a clot in one of the deep veins, or a deep vein thrombosis that ultimately developed into a pulmonary embolism. Now, that's important, but why is that important? A, that's a huge percentage of those patients, but the kicker is those patients were already on prophylaxis for prevention of clot. Anyone who's in the ICU, our protocols in, almost, in most hospitals are, because there's a tendency to clot in general, particularly with severe illness, we give them a prophylactic dose of a heparin product. Thin the blood just a little bit, try to prevent 
clots from forming. You can, there's a higher incidence of clots forming, particularly in the ICU patients outside of COVID, but also in the hospital settings as well. So we always prophylax. In uh, the cohort, which I think was 140 or 180 patients or something there, therein, 30% of those patients on prophylaxis still developed large clots, some of which were life-threatening and devastating. And so this is particularly important because it really fundamentally changes the way that we think about prophylaxing our patients and when you have a COVID patient who's critically ill and they're not getting better with oxygen, with, you know, with um, your other supportive care, and that maybe their chest x-ray just shows mild inflammation, your index of suspicion for a pulmonary embolism or something like that has to be higher because there's a, more, a higher tendency to clot. You also, um, those of us in the U.S., may have read in the media anyway about some very, very initial data, it's not borne out well, but very initial data around younger people, by young I mean 30s and 40s, 20s to 40s, um, who are developing uh, strokes. Again, they're young, they have some mild symptoms, they have a stroke, they go to the hospital, they have a stroke, and then they're found to have COVID. And COVID was obviously the, what we think, is that it made them more have a higher tendency to clot. They clotted, unfortunately, in their brain, in the arterial system, and they ended up having to go to the hospital with stroke-like symptoms. Devastating, absolutely devastating. And there's also evidence that there's uh, initial evidence that there's some more uh, heart attacks that may be, may be related to um, clotting as well. So this is all emerging, but but particularly for the settings that we're focused on today really important to think about prophylaxing all patients. There's a lot of differ, differing recommendations around prophylaxis. This is some empiric recommendations that folks have in some hospitals here. But you know, as we learn more and we think and we sort of understand more, we'll be able to, the, the community, the, the medical community will be able to make stronger recommendations based on data, data-driven decision-making but in the absence of that, as the data is emerging, because this is a novel coronavirus, we really need to think, wow, we see this initial sets of cohorts of patients that are having significant or devastating clotting effects. Let's think about changing the way we prophylax patients to try to prevent those things. And so there is some level of that that is happening, uh, certainly at some of the hospitals around here and in the US, but I also think it's an important consideration for settings that have access to prophylactic heparin uh, to be able to think about how to change it, maybe higher doses that are well documented, at least empirically, as well as having a higher index of suspicion of some of these more devastating complications of folks who might have a tendency to clot. And with that, oof, that's a lot of references. And with that, I will finish um, and turn it over to Anne for some questions. Thanks so much for listening, and I look forward to the time we have for some questions. Thanks, everyone. Um, or th thanks, Dr. Walton. Um, I'd like to invite everyone um, to ask questions right now. You can insert them into the chat or the Q&A, um, and then Dr. Walton will respond. We, on we don't have a lot of time, um, but let's see what questions you have, and we can follow up after as needed. Um, I have a first question for you. Could you talk briefly about treatment ethics in very resource limited settings? Treatment ethics. I'd love to know if the person is still listening. I'd love to know specifically what you mean. So I will, I mean, I, I will extract, if you can chime in, great. What I think you're asking is, how do we think about who to treat and how to treat in limited settings? And, you know, I think that's a very, very challenging situation because I, you know, let's, let's paint a very typical picture. You have um, a 30 bed hospital, half of the beds have access to oxygen, half do not. What do you do 
because you're going to have 40 patients who need oxygen. And, you know, this is ethically murky. And I would be lying to you if I told you I had the right answers. Now, I'm, I'm going to divert for a second and talk about an analogous situation in the U.S. that some of you have heard about, which is in places like Louisiana and certainly in Italy, they had to make decisions about who to ventilate and who not to ventilate because there was a lack of ventilators and there was an overwhelming patients who needed ventilators. And so they came up with a set of criteria. I, don't, I can't tell you, I know a lot about that. I didn't read about the Italy criteria, but in fact, in the US, because we were so worried about this crush of patients uh, and lack of ventilators, it's state by state really developed their own um, guidelines. And I haven't reviewed Massachusetts guidelines, but I will tell you this, that the folks that I was having conversations with were extremely worried about unconscious bias, about bias in general, creeping into the decision-making. Um, and again, most people are not sort of making Machiavelli decisions about who to ventilate and who not. And this is every clinician's absolute worst nightmare. However, when you develop a rubric, how do you guarantee equity? right? Oh, so example, you'll see in the U.S. a lot of African-Americans, there's a, there's a emerging data, African-Americans are faring worse, they're, they're hospitalized more, and they're dying more. And so you can say, well, you know, we're just going to have a, a neutral score based on comorbidities, et cetera. But when you look at the legacy of racism in medicine, and you look at access to care, you know, there's a lot of cofactors, the cofactors that, that, creep into any sort of analysis you're going to have or sort of, of, of guidelines you're going to have. And so, you know, to, to create these guidelines that sort of can, re can that need to reconcile uh, our racist past and racist present, frankly, um, in terms of how we think about medicine and these disparities are really, really tough. If I take that back to resource limited settings, I think they're going to uh, uh, sort of fall into these similar categories. Race obviously might not be an issue. It might, depending on the setting. Tribes, all, there's a lot of different in-groups and out-groups in a lot of different places. Um, and, and, you know, there's, there's male and female dynamics. So these are really tricky. You know, I'm basically answering your question by not answering your question, and <laughs> let's be clear. But I will say it's a great question to, to and I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, I can't tell you that I have the answers, but I will say there's, this is a very important thing to think about, especially with the lack of resources. And when you do have resources, those are going to be limited and really the, the thoughts around equitable access is critical. The other thing that I would say is it shouldn't be an, it's, it's not, it shouldn't be, um, how do I say this? It, you know, it's not a zero sum game. You know, in some cases it is, but this is uh, it just increases our efforts here in this country and other places that are resource rich to 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 create to have more advocacy around these issues, right? Like, you know, if the my colleagues of mine in Haiti and elsewhere don't have access to PPE. Why? Because we're buying up all the PPE here, and we're and you know, I'm not saying we don't need PPE, but we're a part of a global community. And so I think we need to be much more thoughtful and much more conscious uh, around creating the advocacy to understand that we are not the only ones who are suffering from this virus. We are part of a global community. We are one of the richest nations in the country, at least this country, um, excuse me, richest nations in the world. And we need to do the things that we <laughs> should be doing morally and ethically, but also given our legacy of colonialism, given our legacy of slavery, we have a heavy cross to bear in terms of trying to remediate these inequities that we ourselves cause as a country. Uh, I have several questions coming in for from um, our participants, um, so let me um, let me um, start with them. Um, I have one coming in from Haiti um, about oxygen therapy using non-breather masks at um, 10 to 15 LPM. Should we humidificate or not due to aerosolization risk? And there, from this participant also asks, is there a special RSI technique to intubate critical COVID patients? Yeah, great question. So quickly on that, if you don't, so, so in terms of non-rebreather, you know, you can, you know, you can go up to 10 to 15 liters. Again, you are, 
incrementally increasing your risk of aerosolization. The thing that I would say is the, what's important about mitigating those, the, the aerosolization uh, is if you, what I'm going to say may not be applicable, but if you can be in a negative pressure room, that's ideal. Most places that we're talking about don't have access to negative pressure. I would say if you can create the maximum amount of airflow um, in that room, please do. Secondly, fans, et cetera. Se uh, that can be tricky, but yes. Secondly, N95, critical. Now, again, a lot of people um, in clinical care settings with COVID are wearing surgical masks. You know, that's a level of protection. But if, if there's a risk of aerosolization, N95 is absolutely necessary to try to mitigate that nose going infection and really protect your healthcare workers. So really, really essential. And then, you know, eyewear, face, face shield, all of that is critical. So as your risk increases, you wanna make sure that you have, if you can, have full access to PPE and really don the full, fullest extent of the PPE that you can. In terms of uh, protocols for intubation, there's, I would refer you to the literature. There's a lot of different protocols. Again, most people are, again, full PPE and really doing video laryng laryngoscopy to be able to sort of visualize, again, <laughs> the number, uh, the, 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 that's a, 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 the providence of places that have that level of technology. I think in the absence of that, and you do have ventilation, you're sorry, you can intubate someone, you know, just say, you know, really focus on trying to mitigate the risk of nosocomial infection, but understand that it's there, especially with not only, it's important actually, let me just divert from the question for a second to say, things that cause aerosolization that we know, intubation, which we covered that, CPR, right, causes aerosolization of the virus. So if you're performing CPR, you really gotta be careful. Thirdly, nebulizers. We give nebulizers all the time, particularly for people who are short of breath. When you give nebulizers, you're increasing the risk of aerosolization. We have shied away from from using nebulizers uh, in these settings. They're an important tool. I'm not, it's not an absolute contraindication, but if you do give nebulizers, you really want to, again, be as, you know, essentially out of the room if you can. If you're in an open ward, I would say I would really think carefully about it and be in full PPE. Okay, let's move on to our next question, which, which is coming in from Rwanda. Um, is there any observed genetic or racial predilection in terms of severity? So that is a great question. The data that we have right now is that no, there is no evidence of any genetic predispositions for better or for worse for patients. What we typically see, at least in the United States, um, is that this cleaves along race and class which are the issues that we struggle with here in this country. Um, but I would say, you know, it's we're actually, sorry, race, class, and socioeconomic status. And so like any other pathogen, uh, this has a predilection for um, the poor and the vulnerable. And so they, and they typically fare the worst. And so even in a place like Rwanda, people who are living in poverty are probably at higher risk given other comorbidities malnutrition, other things that, again, I think are going to be emerging in terms of the data, excuse me, because, you know, when you think about places like Rwanda or Kenya or East Africa or Haiti, you know, the, 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 the comorbidities, HIV, TB, helminthiasis, um, other chronic issues that are not endemic to places like China, Italy, and the United States, but certainly are in those places, we actually don't know how those patients will do with COVID. So that's something that we really need to focus on. But back to your main question, no evidence of genetic predisposition either way. I have a question from a participant in Haiti. Um, I'm going to unmute um, that um, participant so that um, you can, she can ask it directly. Rosanna? Hello. Hello. We can hear you now. Okay. Um, thank you very much um, for this presentation. I'm sorry for my English because I'm very, I know I, I don't speak very well, but I want to know something. Um, Henry, sure. we have a lot of problems, for example, to do some exams. 
Mm. And um, if we, especially the, the, the dimers, um, ferritine, and, and other things, if we have uh, a good suspicion, we have the patient, the severe patient, who's coming mm. with, um, for example, bad saturation and um, comorbidities, and then we think the, this patient, um, we know about the, um, the thrombosis will exist in this um, pathologies. Um, mm. Can we start the um, heparin treatment, not prophylaxis? So that's a, uh, that's a really good question, uh, and I'm glad you asked. So let me rephrase the question. Uh, your English is excellent, and thank you. Um, I would love to speak to you in Creole, but the other audience members might not understand, so we won't do that. Um, but you know, your question is essentially, if, there's a, if someone has, potentially has COVID, testing is limited, um, sh sh uh, what I understood your question to be is, is there a role for therapeutic doses of heparin as opposed to prophylactic exactly. doses of heparin? Mm -hmm. So that's very tricky because, you know, and again, as you know, it comes with significant risks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your index of suspicion for essentially a, uh, a DVT or a PE would, would need to be really high. Again, I would point you to, if you're worried about a DVT, if you have access to ultrasound, fantastic, great to, way to do that. X-ray might show you a pulmonary infarct, or a discrete infiltrate that's relative to, or, that's, or, a, or a, um, a, a inflammation around an infarct that's much rarer. You might not have access to CT, which I never did when I was in Haiti. And so, you know, I think it's a clinical judgment and a clinical decision making, but I would say given the risks and benefits, understanding that more often than not, your, well, it's tough. This data is, the data is tough. The data, we don't have a lot of data around this, but you know, like anything, when you don't have um, uh, uh, the tools, you're going to do a lot of empiric treatment. If you're in, what I would say is if your index of suspicion is high for a DVT or a PE, you know, I think you, I would say, depending on the person, depending on the details of the case, you should consider a therapeutic heparin. I guess the question then becomes, you know, when, like, how, when do you stop the heparin? If there's a whole series of things when you start something that's empirically how do you deal with that moving forward? Again, that you know, I think you live with daily, and I think it's a challenge there. But I would say it's really a case by case basis. But use you know, your 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 index of suspicion and pretest probability for DVT and PE would need to be pretty high. All right. Um, other thing. Um, and, and in our case, we have a stable patient, but we know he had coma coma coma, coma IDT. And mm -hmm. then uh, we ask them to do sport, exercise. We sometimes they at home, we call to them every time uh, to ask them how it's feel. Um, other tech in Haiti, we have, for example, now in St. Mark, we take about five and six days before we have the result of, for the PCR. Yeah. And then, um, it's a lot, lot of time. And then, you know, the, the, the pathologist progresses. And then sometimes I ask them to do exercise. But um, do you think we can give some aspirin for prophylaxis like 81 milligrams? Yeah, no, that's actually, it's a good question. I don't know if there's any data to sort of go either way on that, but in the setting of, <laughs> of what we talked about in terms of, you know, tendency for thrombosis, you know, and, and again, it's unclear what the, you know, the, the, the underlying sort of cause of thrombosis, whether it's platelet mediated or not platelet mediated. But, you know, if you're giving, I don't, I don't there, the, the addition of an, an aspirin daily, I think is a low risk, potentially higher reward uh, empiric treatment that you might consider, um, given that we're just, you know, we're in a data-free zone here. And so I think, you know, aspirin is, it could be potentially beneficial if it's a platelet mediated clotting cascade or a clotting issue versus not giving it. So I, I, I think that's a fair, that would be a fair empiric uh, therapy. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, good luck in St. Mark. Thank you. We still have several questions, so I'm gonna move on um, to the next one. Um, it's, um, it, seems that, it seems that oxygen is the cornerstone of treatment. Knowing this might be hard, but is there any data about the importance of using high flow oxygen versus nasal cannula to negate the need of an intubation?
I mean, <laughs> basically, there's no data only to, the, the data. Let me put it this way. The main, <laughs> if I were in a setting in which I had either no ability to intubate and ventilate or very limited ability to intubate or ventilate, I would try to maximize my, my oxygen and I would go to high flow because I don't have another option. There's no data. I don't think that I have not seen any data and I'm not aware of data. I've looked actually uh, around in addition to high flow and proning, let's not forget proning, um, how does forestall intubation, excuse me, but you know, I would, if I were, you know, a place that didn't have access to intubation or limited intubation, I would maximize my high flow, understanding I'm increasing my risk, understanding that when I put someone on high flow, I need to be really, really careful about the aerosolization. If I'm in an open ward for other people in the ward, but if it's just in there in a room by myself, but even as a healthcare worker, I'm concerned about myself as well and all my other fellow healthcare workers. So again, there's not, I don't think there's great, you, these, all these questions are great. There's not hard and fast evidence and answers, but I think in the absence of certain diagnostics and therapeutics, you do the best you can. Um, and yeah, I would use high flow, understanding the risks. And that's what I want to underscore. Do what you can understand the risks to your healthcare workers, because again, you know, healthcare workers get sick and then there's no one to take care of the patients and the healthcare workers themselves are sick. So, you know, you really want to be uh, cautious about, you know, just making sure that everyone's protected if you can. Okay, our next question is coming from Honduras. Um, in countries like Honduras, and institutions are probably going to use a mix of um, uh, medications in patients um, and approaches um, from home isolation to hospitalization. Um, mm -hmm. Can you briefly give your opinion on these different approaches? So it's a great question and it gets back to how do we think about controlling the spread of the virus, right? So that wasn't your question, but it is your question kind of. Um, and so, you know, I would say, and I always say like if someone can be at home they might do better at home, depends on the setting significantly, but we don't want to hospitalize patients that don't need to be hospitalized. So there's a couple of factors, there's a couple of things in your question that I want to address. Number one is back to how the virus spreads. If you look at the data from China um, and actually uh, emerging data in the United States, most of the people who are getting sick from an index case are from their close contacts and families. So what that means is, I get diagnosed and I get told, go home, isolate, self-isolate, and after 14 days, if you don't need to be hospitalized, you're good to go, right? Or whatever the recommendation is, something like that. I live in a house with people. You know, in some settings, I live in a house with many people. It's almost impossible to isolate myself. And what the data bears out is that most of the time I'm spreading the virus to everybody in my house, right? 80% of infections in China at a, a certain phase of their outbreak were in close contact with families. And so what that means is it, 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 it creates another question, which is how can you send home people home safely? Number one, from a medical standpoint, to make sure that if they do get sick, remember this very fragile period of five days to sort of 10 days where you can take a precipitous decline. So if you do send patients home, how can you be sure, how can you think about if they do get sick quickly that they could get back to the hospital? That's challenge number one. Challenge number two is if you do send them home for self-isolation, how can you be sure that they're self-isolating in a way that actually can happen? And in so many settings, it can't happen. I mean, again, self-isolation also implies you have lots of rooms in your house. And some of these places don't have a lot of rooms. Or patients, people are sharing beds. People are, families are sharing beds. People are, our families are sharing rooms. And then thirdly, if I say, okay, it's really important to go home. Again, it's also important to remember that a lot of people lack the social supports, right? Because if I am told, um, and this is a problem everywhere, if I'm told to go home and don't go out, how do I get food? How do I get, you know, all the things that I need for my life? So. We are especially in places with significant food insecurity, 
especially in places where, you know, I might have to go get my water that, you know, I don't have running water and I have to go get it somewhere and maybe my family can't. So all of these things, these, these recommendations that we make, it's really important to, to recognize that, you know, when we say wash your hands, that, <laughs> that implies that I have access to running water or some source of water and soap. A lot of people don't. So, you know, I think if you look at places like China and South Korea and Vietnam, what they did, and again, Guatemala might be different in terms of the ability to do this, and I have no idea what their national protocols are, but because they knew the data, and because they knew that most people got sick, infected other people at home, what they did and what people are trying to do here in the U.S. and other places too is to say, can we put this person in another place? in the U.S. it's like college dorms, there's no school right now, um, or in some setting in which we can isolate them from their family, give them all the support they need, nutritional, and observe them, because if they get sick, we transport them right to the hospital. And so we're doing two things. Number one, we're making sure if they get sicker, we can get them to the hospital quickly, and that's our responsibility as the, the institution, whatever you consider that. Number two, they're not with their family, therefore they're not getting their family sick. You know, that's ideal in the U.S. We don't do that. We're trying. The U.S. is a mess, an absolute mess. But in other places that have that are less um, able to, uh, from a governmental standpoint, either have the resources to do that or the political sort of nature to do that, it becomes very tricky. So then you say, well, okay, what about hospitalization? Hospitalization is great, but you don't want to fill up your hospital beds with patients who don't need to be hospitalized because then when the people who are really sick come in, then you don't have space for them, you don't have room for them. And when what we've seen in a lot of these outbreaks is, you know, it follows the curve, it follows the curve, it's mass and it's time. Low number of cases, low number of cases, and then you hit that inflection point and then it's just, it, the, the, it's a logarithmic curve. And so, you know, your hospitals quickly turn the corner. It's happening in Haiti right now. Um, I, our, I think the colleague from Haiti who was in St. Mark, I think her question is, stems from the fact that she's probably talking about real patients that she has, because I know, because I used to work in Haiti, Haiti is seeing a lot more cases. Two weeks ago, they hardly had anybody. Now, there's many, many more patients, and their hospitals are being inundated with cases that are suspicious for COVID. And so, and I think if you can send home patients, people home safely, that's ideal, but you have to also be worried about social supports and making sure that they're as supported as possible, as well as the risk of them infecting their family. So I have an, a question coming from another country um, that is being very hard hit by the pandemic, um, Peru, and this might mm. be a little bit outside of your wheelhouse so we can follow up afterwards um, um, with um, this participant. Um, this participant would like to know how much um, do we know right now about COVID-19 and preterm delivery? Ooh, that is outside of my wheelhouse. I will say there's, so, Outside my wheelhouse, there is emerging data. I, when I was reviewing the, some of the data yesterday. Uh, I didn't look at all the data around obstetrics and uh, COVID and pregnancy and preterm delivery. It's out there. I saw some papers. I know that there's data there. Um, and I can actually circle, if, if you are able to connect with Anne, I can circle back and um, refer you to some, some of the literature. Um, and it's a, a fantastic question. I apologize for not being able to answer it, but I know that some people can and the resources are out there. Thanks. Um, and I want to let um, this participant and others know that we do have um, information on maternal and neonatal health and can share that data with you. Um, and it's also available on our website. Um, so I want them um, to follow up with a, a different um, type of question. Um, this, I believe, is coming from the United States, um, and this person is asking, is there a way to get sufficient medical standard PPE into low-income countries in Haiti? Who makes N95s? Can they be made in country, and what else can be made in country? So it's a great question. Um, PPE is a challenge. PPE is a particular challenge because, as I noted earlier, a lot of resource rich countries are buying up all the PPE. Um, there's a limited market. Most of many, many of the manufacturers are in Asia, particularly China. And, um, you know, the inequities of globalization are at, at play here, like they are in so many other instances in terms of um, those with uh, more power and control 
subsuming all the resources. So, you know, can PPE be made locally? It depends. Some can, some it's much more of a challenge. And 95s are tricky. They need to be standardized. They're, I think they're pretty technical to make. And so unless there's a manufacturer in your country who can make N95s, that's gonna be a very tricky uh, problem to solve. And uh, if they're not there already, I think it's pretty, I, don't, I can't say I'm an industry expert, I think it's pretty hard to stand that up. What I would say is the rest of the PPE, outside of the Tyvek suit that some are wearing, but some of the PPE um, can be either made in country and or you can find workarounds. So for example, I know that in a variety of countries, Katie, including others, people are making 3D, uh, 3D printed face masks, right? And 3D printed eyewear. Those are fantastic. Those are uh, generally affordable, um, can be made in country if you have a 3D printer or folks who have a 3D printer and the ability to, to um, scale up in terms of their production. Gowns, gowns are tricky, but, and again, if, if you're not making them, Maybe you have access to cloth gowns. So I'm thinking about surgery. Surgery, they use gowns. You're, if you have a high number of cases of COVID, your elective surgery numbers are probably down. Um, and so, you know, access to using those cloth gowns that they might use or cotton gowns that they might use uh, in the surgical suite and using them as your PPE instead of the disposable one. Those are, t those are very acceptable. I think it, it's critical to make sure that the, the, the way you sort of clean them um, you know, again, you're, you get your your essential workers that are cleaning the, the those cloth gowns need to be protected as well. It's really critical and important. And then finally, you know, there's a I would refer you to uh, a CDC, and, and again, I think actually I would refer you to um, a Dartmouth uh, publication already out there that goes through PPE current protocols for PPE, at least as defined by the WHO and CDC but also what can you do when you don't have access to all of those things? And there's a whole spectrum of things um, around, you know, co face coverings and eye coverings and, you know, gowns. And like, it goes from, I have them to, I have some things to, I actually don't have any of those things. What can I do? And it's a fantastic resource. Uh, again, I would, uh, Anne can send out the, the link to that paper, I think, or to the white paper. It's a very great resource. And it goes through some of those things, and you know, I would say it's you know it's it's critically important. I think production production of PPE is going to be ramped up now that China, the major manufacturer, is back online in terms of production. But you know, protecting your your workers, whether they're community health workers, nurses, doctors, pharmacists, anyone who's in contact with COVID patients, absolutely essential. So it's a really good question. I appreciate you asking. I want to confirm um, that you that you're open to a couple more questions. I have all the time in the world. I know other people don't, so ask away. Wonderful, thank you. So I have another question on PPE to follow up on that. This one is coming from Katie. Um, one of the things um, that this participant is worried about is the heat in hunt, uh, uh, the heat um, in the, um, in country and in particular in um, the COVID nineteen unit. Um, mm. So the PPE is going to make it very hot and um, and. And this person, uh, participant is, in, is concerned that it might be impossible. Um, so what do you suggest in terms of air conditioning and other um, ways of managing that discomfort? Yeah, so that's a great question. And here's, um, I have a thought on that, which is in Ebola, in the 2014 to 2016 Ebola epidemic, thankfully Haiti was spared. West Africa was really incredibly hard hit. I was I was a frontline clinician during that uh, outbreak, and we faced the same problem. West Africa is really hot. Haiti is really hot. Many countries are extremely hot, and so you're, as a clinician in full PPE, your ability to be on the ward at any given time is limited, right? Because what we were actually were worried about in West Africa was heat stroke. Um, for clinicians who are there taking care of patients. And we actually almost had someone in the red zone where all the Ebola patients were sort of collapsed. Uh, and we did it at one point as well. So what we did, because the, I don't have an answer to your question of sort of a magical solution for the, or a practical solution for the PPE. It's critical, you need it, can't take it off, it's essential. 
uh, and it's uncomfortable and it's hot and it, it, it's terrible. And I wish we didn't have to use it. But what can we do to think about processes to mitigate that? So in West Africa, in our Ebola treatment units, we went through in shifts. And so we were not sitting on the wards. The wards were there and the sort of the clinicians were outside of the wards. And we had, we, we grouped our clinicians into uh, teams and then they went through every hour. And so our maximum amount of time was an hour. You couldn't exceed an hour. You always had to go through, go in with a buddy because if you went in by yourself, you might sort of have collapsed and no one can help you because no one knows. There's no cameras or anything. And so we really figured out a, 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 it was a process solution to this very issue of, you know, making sure that we could see the patients. The patients were seeing frequently but we were going through in teams throughout the, the, the ward. Air conditioning is going to be tricky. I wouldn't necessarily invest in it if you don't already have it because, you know, it's a, the installation is going to be challenging if you, in, a, in an existing ward. Um, B, um, you know, it's, I don't think air conditioning in and of itself is worrisome for the transmission dynamics, but it also is very, very costly for your energy costs and your operational costs. If you can do it and you have access to it and you can make sure that there's effective airflow in the room, it's not contraindicated necessarily, but I would say it's tricky to do as, as an afterthought. And you know, there's other, other workarounds that you can do in terms of the thing that I mentioned around teams and probably some other things that might be helpful as well. Thank you. Um, I have what I believe is a final question. Um, be, beyond co-hosting, should treatment protocols change at all when you are using a case definition to diagnose as compared to lab test confirmation? Great question. Um, probably, hmm. I'm hedging. It's great. Um, it's a really thoughtful question and I think you know, I, let, me, let me, here's what I would say. I would say if you're using a case definition, inherent in the case definition is the fact that you're not, you don't have a, you're not, it's not a confirmed diagnosis. And so one of the ways to think about it is to, is to always have that in the back of your mind and to say, I'm treating for COVID, which again, in, the, in many settings is, is supportive care, oxygen, germane serum therapy. We've talked about that. But I would widen my range of therapeutics if it's a case definition in terms of how I'm treating the patient because I'm not really sure they have COVID, right? So let's say someone comes in with fever, um, dry cough, and um, shortness of breath. Ooh, COVID, probably COVID, okay. Admit them to the COVID ward and they're not getting better. You know, I'm going to actually two things. One, I'm going to walk, if I have, can broaden my differential and broaden my workup, I'm going to do that. Does this person have TB? I don't know. Maybe present in the same way or it can present in the same way. So I'm going to think about getting, um, you know, getting sputum microscopy, which many places have access to. If I have a gene expert, I'm going to try to get sputum, test them for TB, right? I may think about starting empiric antibiotics if I think it's a pneumonia, a bacterial pneumonia that looks like COVID, but not, not, might not be COVID. So I think the treatment of COVID doesn't preclude your ability to both think about other things, work up other things, and empirically treat other things as you're sort of thinking about COVID plus. Is this COVID, but is it something else that I really need to figure out that, and it's masquerading uh, as a COVID-19 patient? Thank you so much. Do you have any um, final comments that you'd like to share with us? I don't. I think my two things that I would say. I am hopeful this talk is going to be both out of date in a month because there'll be fantastic new therapeutics that we can use. I hope. I'm a little bit skeptical, but I hope so. And second, again, I'm, uh, folks like um, I think Dr. Idwa, who was uh, who was calling in from Haiti, you know, I'd love for someone who's in the field, not in the field, in the, in the place where, they're, um, you know, where, they're, where their outbreak is happening, you know, they have real life experience on the ground, 
you know, it would be great if they give the talk next time, just because I think the perspective's different. I'm I'm usually not in the United States. I'm elsewhere, you know, alongside people like Rosanna and others. Um, but I'm here. I'm a surrogate. I'm a fill-in for my amazing colleagues who are in um, other places that are hard hit. And I think that's going to be a fantastic um, uh, next step in this talk. But also, you know, keep a close eye on the literature if you have access to it. Most of it, thankfully, most of the literature that's being produced by the medical journals is not behind a paywall. So it's open access and we're really grateful for that. I mean, everything should be like that, let's be clear. Um, but, you know, we have access, everyone should have access if you have a stable internet connection to the emerging data. Um, so much is changing, we're learning so much, keep a close eye on that. And to the extent that you can change your practice if you need to based on that data, that's great. Um, so, you know, I would, those are my closing comments. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Walton and everyone who has joined us on the line today. I wanted to let you know um, that we um, are posting the materials on our website. We'll, we can also share um, that um, and materials with you afterwards. Um, we want to hear from you with, with the other, top, other topics you'd like us to cover in coming weeks um, and if there are other ways that we can be helpful with um, your work. Um, we'll look forward to, um, to seeing you again at our next webinar session. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much. Thank you.